on this very special episode of Team Building Saves the World. <laughs> because I was enjoying this so much. And, and I personally, I think it's a remarkably important conversation. Yeah, I mean, Greg, Greg is a handsome man, so I saw that. Um, and, 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 and a very good improviser, and 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 and, and to boot, a nice person. Um, hey, so- <laughs> for for my listening audience out there, Greg is a very handsome man. If we could just go around the round table and say what your favorite features of my face are, <laughs> and they, you know, though we haven't gotten to our ten thousand uh, dollar show, uh, maybe one day, but um, but you get you get love and appreciation in other ways through improv. Nice. Wait, Rich, I was under the impression that we were being paid $10,000 for this. <laughs> what actually takes somebody from improv and decides that I need to tell the corporate world of the benefits of this? <laughs> yeah, it was actually more the corporate world telling me. The goal of theater is uh, to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comforted. Team, it's me, your old friend Rich Rinnensland, host of Team Building Saves the World, the show where I speak to the leaders and innovators of the team building industry from all across the globe, trying to find out what about that industry is so important, especially in the world of today. And today, we're exploring diversity. I'm talking to the creators of an innovative interview based improv program called White Privilege Black Power, Greg Tinsdale and Eva Lewis, as well as the author of the new book, I Quit The Life Affirming Joy of Giving Up. Kanoor Bahal. But first, I need to send thanks out to my supporters at Team Bonding. If your team is ready to learn about teamwork through the power of play, then visit teambonding.com to learn more. And now, team, join me in welcoming the creators of White Privilege Black Power, Greg Tinsdale and Eva Lewis, and the founder and CEO of Mind Hatch, Kanoor Bahal. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, Rich. That group of applause you hear, that applause you hear, that's coming from a trap group of people under my desk. (gasps) Don't worry, they're glad to be there. I feed them regularly. Sorry, go ahead, Greg, you were saying? (laughs) Yeah, Rich, I wanted to say that my name is actually Greg Tyndale. There's no S. Oh, I'm so sorry. I will. But the the S S is totally common. Um, (laughs) uh, The only reason I bring it up is because my old wrestling coach, when he wanted to make me mad, would go, Great job, Tinsdale. <laughs> and so there's, there's like deep down there. I'm, I'm, it's fine, but I just want to let everyone know. You know, I was thinking about editing it to correct that, and but I'm not. This is great. Yeah. This is great. No, no. Keep and I'm on. also just so entertained that it was not my name that got mispronounced. <laughs> right. It was the white guy's name that got mispronounced. By the other white guy. Like a banner day, yeah. And, and actually, I'm really embarrassed about it because my last name is Renansland, which means I have spent my entire life going through a variety of weird last names, yep. including when I was in high school, I had a friend of mine who just gave up and started calling me Reindeer Sled. <laughs> <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Let's start with you guys. Kenor, let's start with you and Mind Hatch. Can you actually, just as a, a history of all of this, tell my yeah. team about you and the company? Yeah, of course. So Mind Hatch is my uh, creative consultancy that I've had for about seven and a half years. I can't believe it. I uh, founded it after spending a few years doing innovation strategy work at Deloitte. Actually, as my dad always calls it, Deloitte's another. There you uh, go. Oh, we found the S. We found the S, Greg. Yeah. (laughs) um, um, uh, Yeah. And so uh, through Mind Hatch, what we're all about is just creating the conditions for innovation and creativity to thrive within organizations and within teams. So we do design thinking and human centered design. We do organizational improv and innovation facilitation. And then, of course, what we're going to be talking about today with Greg and Eva, which is their show, White Privilege, Black Power. While all that sounded perfect and like you had said it (laughs) over and over and over again for many years. (laughs) Give us a little bit more about what Mind Hatch's philosophy is and what exactly they're trying to tackle in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely, you know, it's definitely born of a lot of gaps that I felt as someone working in companies and in organizations, nonprofit and for profit alike, you know, where we're kind of still stuck, dare I say, trapped in this kind of factory mentality in terms of how people work, how offices are set up the prioritization on FaceTime, you know, and um, even bureaucracies, right, are very much like um, traced back to how like factories are set up. And the truth is that especially in like a knowledge services environment, which a lot of people work in now, 
that doesn't really work. That's not really the right culture or the right way of work or even the way of thinking Mm. to really inspire and produce innovative and creative thinking. And innovative and creative thinking is what's going to help your company stand the test of these like never ending changes to the economy, you know, that are now happening even more rapidly than they were before. So I view it as both kind of like an organizational culture play, you know, like I, I'm really passionate about helping organizations not create more me's who have to like leave the company to okay. kind of do innovation and creativity work. Um, right. And so that's kind of one thing that really lights a fire in my belly, but also just in order to innovate and to be a good business, like you need to be innovative. You need to be creative. You need to be paying attention to DEI because all of that is instrumental to your bottom line. So to me, it's equal parts creative thinking, but also just good business strategy. Uh, mm-hmm. When I did some middle management stuff, just so everybody is aware of who I am for you guys, mm-hmm. I've been a professional actor, creator, writer since I was 25 years old, mm-hmm. which means I have waited all the tables. I have tended all the bars. <laughs> And for a long time, I was in corporate security work where I actually managed to make it up to middle management and then realized that was nowhere near what I wanted to be. Um, But while I was there, we were constantly being told it is far easier to maintain the people you have than it is to hire new folks. And it seems so much easier now for people to just, dare I quote your book, say I quit Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so you're saying that we do that you're focusing more on trying to teach the marketplace to actually change for the people that they're employing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like for me, leaving and being an entrepreneur was the right choice, right? It was mm-hmm. the way I was going to get things that I valued, such as working in the meritocracy, right? But that's not for everyone. You know, not everyone has to be a small business owner or an entrepreneur. Some sure. people really want to, and for good reasons, you know, want to work in other companies. And so, you know, there's always going to be a critical mass of people who are like that. And so, you know, you need to kind of get the best out of them and have them do good work, enjoy being there and not be treated like a cog in a wheel. Right. And, and understand that they have a really big role to play in the culture of your organization and, culture in turn has a huge role to play in how successful your business is. So I think it's that. Yeah. And then of course, kind of getting into the tactical of also we use design thinking to really help you form innovative solutions that are, you know, in response to, to the marketplace and really deeply understanding through anthropological and empathic methods, like understanding who your customers are and Hmm. what they're deepest desires are. Right. So you can design for the future, you know, as opposed to the past. Nice. Yeah. Can you actually define what EDI means? It was something you had mentioned previously. Oh, DEI, DEI, DEI um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, it's kind of a common um, acronym for for those three things. Yeah. So, when was it that you and your company met Eva and Greg? Yeah. Well, uh, do Eva and Greg want to want to talk about that too? I'll, I'll share my side of the love story, um, <laughs> and they can share their their impression of it. But um, well, let's let them uh, stay quiet, and you give yours, and let's see if yeah. they shake yeah, their yeah. heads no <laughs> or not. Be no. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so I have known Greg and Eva for quite literally 10 years. So it was 10 years ago, actually last month that I first started doing improv comedy in the Washington DC area. It's when I took okay. my first class. And so shortly thereafter, Eva and I met because we were, um, both cast on the same, uh, improv team in Washington DC that still exists. And Eva is still a part of, and I miss dearly since I moved away from DC, but I, I crash the rehearsals whenever I can. And so, and then Greg, you know, when I was coming up through classes in DC, Greg was like the dude, it was like the guy, the star on the stage who was already in lots of teams that I would, as like a thirsty young student, like go and watch, you know, at different, at different places. And so, yeah, yeah. So Greg was definitely kind of a, a veteran of the scene, you know, before I became a veteran of the scene. So I've known them for a long time and I definitely was aware that after, I think you all started White Privilege Black Power after I moved to Seattle, I think. We'll, we'll match up timelines, but um, but I, I definitely was aware that Greg and Eva had started collaborating and one of the things that they were collaborating on was this show called White Privilege Black Power and I'd seen a couple of their videos online and uh, it was obviously a really, really great format, you know, like using improv and using comedy and using all of the skills that improvisers um, like Eva and Greg are amazing at 
to um, draw light on, you know, difference, like topics mm. of difference, you know, whether it be race related, gender related, um, about ableism, you know, LGBTQ identities. And so they were just doing really remarkable things with their incredible skill and charm, to, you know, to kind of illustrate and bring to life, you know, these lives of difference that aren't often uh, brought to life. And uh, yeah, and so I was extremely tickled when they reached out to me a couple of years ago mm. and said, Knorr, we think this has a lot of play for organizations, you know, doing DEI work, sure. and we would like to do it through MindHatch. So I was tickled not only because I know and love Greg and Eva and love the premise of the show, but also from seven years ago when I founded MindHatch, I, I always kind of knew in my gut that there was some... There was something there between improv and diversity work. I just knew there was something that could be used and, and that the skills that I had trained in as an improviser were critical, you know, to kind of having difficult, difficult conversations and having empathy for people who are not like you. But Greg and Eva just kind of like gave it to me on a silver platter. Like, yes, here's the connection, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and so, yeah, so it was really exciting from, from both standpoints. Yeah. Okay, Greg, Eva, let's back up from your perspective now. Tell us a bit about yourselves, how you guys came together, and where this all grew from. Mm -hmm. Kenora knows, like, how kind of, like, when she first saw Greg, like, I just knew Greg was around. I kind of <laughs> felt like, yeah, like I, I knew he was around. I knew he was a veteran. I called him, like, the first wave of, like, watched improv. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. So, but you weren't, you weren't as, you weren't as starstruck as Kenora? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Greg, Greg is a handsome man, so I saw that. Honestly. Um, and, and, and a very good improviser, and and and, and, and to boot, a nice person. Um, hey, so. nice. <laughs> yeah. exactly. For for my listening audience out there, Greg is a very handsome man. <laughs> oh, guys, this is a roundtable, right? You know, like Greg has to it say is. like nice yes. things about you. Yes, yes right? that's it. Yes, now you must be nice to everybody else, Greg. It's yes, and I, well, I guess very it would be nice if you just. If we could just go around the round table and say what your favorite features of my face are, <laughs> we could just, that could be one way to just start this off. Can we choose uh, only one? Oh, it's super. I was going to name your fashion sense, but I've only just met yeah. you. So. <laughs> well, I, I can jump in and say that, you know, I, I started doing improv in 2005, 2005, 2006. And at the same time, uh, you know, I had a day job where I was a real estate agent. So I was, at, I was building this real estate business and, you're taking all the business books, taking all the seminars, all this stuff. But then I was also going through improv classes and I was like, wow, all these lessons I'm learning in improv are the exact same as the business books and the mm. business seminars, only better. They, they were teaching me so much out of it. And so I, I think from day one of, of doing improv and doing that kind of level of comedy was I saw the connection to the practical world and the business world and then okay. thus the organizational world. So I, I always knew that I wanted to to do something like that to be able to show other people how these simple improv rules can make you better at your job and better at life. So I always knew I wanted to do that. But um, the, the very first improv group I was ever in was one called uh, Jinx. And um, a bunch of people in that had gone on to success in, in multiple levels of, of comedy, um, also all lovely people. But the joke always was, was I kept being like, hey, how do we get someone to pay us $10,000 to do a show? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> I, I, was, I kept being, and I, at that point, I was not good at improv. Like, I wasn't good yet. <laughs> but I was like, we need to find somebody to pay us $10,000 to do this improv show. Sure. And so at each level of getting better and better at improv, I kept being like, is this the $10,000 show? Is this the $10,000 show? <laughs> and um, when, I, uh, when I met Eva, um, we we were we were cast on a um, I forget which exact show it was, but was it Die Die Die? Yeah, it might have been. We, I think we were doing an improvised uh, horror show, so it would ah. be like a horror uh, it was like a movie, Halloween and show, and it would right? be, yeah. be improvised. Yeah, and I remember, you know, the audience. I, 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 like we said, I consider myself a very good improviser. Nobody cared about me. Everybody loved Eva. Like Eva got all the laughs. The audience is like yeah. were all about her. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to hitch my star to this <laughs> star. And so I knew, I knew selfishly I wanted to do a show with Eva just because I wanted to perform with her because she's so great. Nice. And um, so then it, uh, it started right around the 2016 election mm -hmm. where, you know, we were both living in and around Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I remember waking up the next day after the results and it was like doomsday. Like people were on the Metro crying. There was a guy on the corner in DuPont circle in DC, just like giving out free hugs. Like it, it was clear. Yeah. It was clear that like 
there was like this big rift of people didn't understand the differences of what was going on in the different parts of the country. Right. Um, and my background is I grew up in a little town called Westminster, Maryland, which is uh, like a very rural kind of country area. Sure. I grew up across the street from a, a cornfield and then, you know, made my way out. But a lot of my friends are those people that America didn't know were around and ready to vote in that election. And, mm. you know, so I kind of had this very unique view of myself being a, a more liberal guy, but understanding where these other folks were coming from. So I reached out to Eva and I said, hey, let's do this two person show where we just talk about what's different about each other and we'll ask each other honest questions and then just learn and get to share that with the audience. Mm -hmm. And um, it, we, we did it once. And Eva th thought she, it was only going to be one. Yeah, I knew I, I knew we were going to keep doing it. No, I, I, I thought it was a one and done because the Eva was friend. like, "This is the ten thousand dollars show." <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done in improv. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 improv. I would say improv is a money losing endeavor. Yeah, you will never get that ten thousand and one dollars show. No, you, you you get it in good feelings and in, in applause as yeah. well. But yeah, Greg, Greg was exactly that because we, we did it for a show that Washington Improv Theater was doing. And so I was like, oh, here's a, you know, one, this is nice, you know, we'll go forth and do it, you know, and, and, and I definitely thought it was a one and done thing. But then Greg was like, okay, we got something, this and this. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe this is something we'll keep going. And we've been doing it for the past four years with it. And I should say my background is I, I grew up and still do live in Maryland, right outside DC. Mm. And now I work in politics as you see Obama, 2008 <laughs> uh, newspaper there, but got into improv because looking for something fun. And it always enjoyed watching improv when I was in Chicago. Chicago when I was uh, attending law school. Mm -hmm. But um, but the thing with improv that I think, you know, translates into anything is that everyone does improv. Like in this conversation we're having is improvised. And so the notion of trying to add a funny layer on top of that, and then also another layer of trying to take on a lot of times difficult subjects and making them accessible on, on a level was challenging, but also fun to do with Greg. And then also with the special guests that we had later on as we were going on, we would invite folks who may not have our point of view to come on and then we would play around with that as well. So it's, it's been a, a good whirlwind. So what actually was it about improv that attracted the three of you? I mean, mm -hmm. I come from an improv background myself. I don't think there's, an, uh, there's a performer or actor alive today who hasn't at least dipped their toes in the world mm -hmm. of improv because it is, it's a fantastic mental exercise just mm -hmm. to get you ready for even just conversation. But what, what drew you guys to it? Yeah, I'll jump in first. Um, sure. For for me, I I went to I, I went to Northwestern Law in Chicago. So like I had all three years of school, I would go to Second City and I O sure. and other smaller improv theaters. And so I, I I you know I was gonna say I grew up with it, not even grow up with it, but I uh, would watch <laughs> it and thoroughly enjoyed it. And so it wasn't until a friend said that he was gonna do it while while um, we were studying for the bar um, that I took my first class. And I think what entices me to improv is one, it's not scripted, yeah. right? So you, which is also the part that people are scared about uh, right. because it's not scripted, but they, they, there's no rehearsal. It's all about being in the moment and being present and like listening. I mean, I like the, the, the phrase listening like a, uh, like a thief in terms <laughs> of like where to find those nice little nuggets of things. up. Mm -hmm. And the thing is like with improv, it is completely freeing if you allow it uh, to be. And like if you, and the thing is like trusting yourself and your scene partners and your, your group, but what you're trying to do. And when you get that nice message of like finding people like the, the team I was on, you know, with Kenora, I'm still on press play. We have that. And I have that also with Greg and then like you trust these people right. to take care of you and to yeah. support you. And also, it's also one of the rare places uh, in the world. I, as in, and I shouldn't say the world, but rare places in one's life where you will have unconditional support, which is a baseline, right? In terms of uh, improv. It's one of the and rare that, rules of it. Yeah. Exactly. The yes and principle, right? Mm -hmm. Which we all learn as baby improvisers uh, coming <laughs> in. So that, that's that's uh, my improv, you know, uh, journey and why I've, I've kept to it. And, in the, you know, though we haven't gotten to our ten thousand uh, dollar show, uh, maybe one day, but um, but you get you get love and appreciation in other ways through improv. Nice. Wait, Rich, I was under the impression that we were being paid ten thousand dollars. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's all in coupons. <laughs> Oh, well, that's great. I love that. I really hope that's fun. okay. Yeah. That's, okay. that's a lifetime of savings. I mean, that's amazing. You have like so many peas coming your way. I and it can't, can't be taxed. You can't tax coupons. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Kenor. As Yeah. What, what, what led you into the improv game? So, so my story is one of 
tragedy. Uh, <laughs> so I um, um, when don't do I, that when I'm drinking, Kendall. <laughs> sorry. Um, um, so I grew up as what I later knew was called a comedy nerd. Loved comedy. Watched Comedy Central night and day, even when they were only had stand up shows and had nothing, no original content. <laughs> and um, um, and so when I I went, moved from rural Ohio to New York City for college, and like the second I got there, I sent internship resumes to like The Daily Show and Late Night mm. with Conan O'Brien and um and, and any, anything I could. Um, and my sophomore year, I got really lucky and I got to intern at Late Night with Conan O'Brien. It was my for my first time. I went back again my senior year. But so when I was like 19 and in uh, a sophomore and interning there, I was like around a lot of people who were either, you know, performing improv or doing um, monologues for improv shows. Um, like the writing staff were always at Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in mm-hmm. New York. And so I was at UCB like every week, seemingly watching shows and taking it in. And one of my fellow interns was a couple years ahead of me, Katie. She came to me one day and she said, hey, Kenora, I think you're funny. I think you might really like improv. You should take a class. And I did. I signed up for a class and I went to the first class and I got really, really scared. I was so terrified in that class. And I only and I, I, I left that class and I never went back. I had paid for a full course. I went to the first of eight classes and never went back. And I immediately had so much regret. It took me a few years to figure out the source of that regret. But it was I was scared to be bad at something uh, for even like a moment like at age 19 i was still kind of a really annoying hyper achieving perfectionist <laughs> kind of person yeah you, had, you sure. had a fixed mindset Kenor. You had a fixed ah, totally mindset. i had a totally fixed mindset and what i what i also learned was that i was self-selecting things in my life that i knew i would be good at okay right? to kind of maintain the facade of like being a perfectionist and being a high achiever. And so I was scared to be bad at something and um, I always regretted it, but it took me a few years to really figure out why I had so much regret. So cut to a couple of careers later, I'm living in Washington, DC. I'm working at Deloitte's as my dad says, and I get like an innovation role in the company that is all work from home. Mm. Huzzah. Huzzah. Amazing. <laughs> and I, fi- I look at it, I'm like, oh, I have a lot of time now. I don't have like an hour commute to like Northern Virginia anymore. <laughs> and my then boyfriend was like living in a different city. And I was like, I got a lot of time. <laughs> like, let me get this monkey off my back. <laughs> and I signed up for a class and intended it to be just do the class. Don't even do the class show. Just do it to say you did it. And I remember at the end of that class, the teacher asked, Hey, so who's going to be in the class showcase this weekend? And every single person except me raised their hand. And I was Uh, like, oh man, I can't be the jerk. I can't be the (laughs) only one who doesn't show up to class showcase. So I did. And then I signed up for another class and then I got addicted, just fully, fully addicted to it. And yeah, so as I, as I always tell friends, I I started doing uh, improv the second time to settle an old emotional score for myself. <laughs> and um, yeah, and much like Greg, I I was I took my first class at the exact same moment I was in that innovation project. And sure. so I was really firsthand noticing the parallels of like what makes a good innovation workshop, you know, what makes a collaborative team. It was like nearly identical, even down to the terminology of what I was learning as a baby improviser, you know, mm-hmm. as, as Eva said, you know, mm-hmm. and so, I knew there was a lot of connective tissue there and like mind hash is really kind of the result of, of what I observed in those moments. Nice. Greg, it's on to you now. So you were a mogul in the real estate industry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what made you decide that improv was what you needed to sink your teeth into? I also just always loved stand up comedy and I never really understood the way into it. And then <laughs> I had, I had bought tickets to the Washington Washington improv show and um, it was at this little hole in the wall theater, like a black box theater, you know, 50 seats, dirty, you know, just like a, a place where you get into it. And if, if that kind of thing is made for you, once you get into that, you're yeah. like, oh, this yeah. feels at home. <laughs> and I felt like, you know, I can ask, is it the same theater that we fondly called the alley behind it, Rat Alley? Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was, exactly. it was the, 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 D, the DCAC yeah. uh, and Adams Morgan in Washington, D.C. But so I ended up, uh, we bought tickets, went to go see a show, and I'd never seen improv before. And there's one person, uh, he, he's since gone on to move to New York, and he's become a writer on different things, his name is Zach Phillips. And I'll, I'll shout him out. He, he has a really great uh, narrative podcast, a comedy called 64th Man that you can, you can go by. So that's really great. But anyway, um, I remember watching him during the show, and he ended up doing this mermaid character. 
And it was just like, it came out of nowhere. Like he was just like a mermaid and his legs were like a mermaid fins. <laughs> and uh, so after the show, I go up to him and I'm like, hey, so you, you created that character before tonight, right? And he goes, no, no it was all improvised. And I was like, listen, buddy, you can <laughs> tell me. I know you at least have done that character before. Maybe you didn't do this bit before, but you did not invent that right now. And he was like, no, it's like totally made up on the spot. And I left like not believing him that it was <laughs> improvised. And then at that point, I was like, All right, well, I need to go try to take class and, and see what the what this is all about. And then it was then the same thing of the first class. I was like, oh, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Excellent. Mm-hmm. And that always seems to be the way of it. Either with improv, you either love it or you don't. And yeah. uh, I was I was the exact same way. I was actually I, I started as a side project. Uh, just to give you a little more uh, background about me, I was a blacksmith back in like the early '90s for the at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Festival, and they had all of these afternoon classes when we weren't working on the weekends that during the during the week you could do. And I took my first improv class there, and I was like, I must keep doing this because you're right. It is uh, once you settle into the rules of yes and, which is just a way of describing how you actually take an idea and you support that idea and lift that idea higher, and everybody around you is building to do the same thing, you, you just want more and more of that. Uh, speaking of more and more, guys, I do need to take a brief second here while I step away and talk to my team. And I want to tell them all about a company I am very proud to be a part of, Team Bonding. Team Bonding was founded over 20 years ago with one simple question. How can employees have a great time while fostering strong, authentic bonds between people who work together? They've created a catalog of innovative events using the power of play as a learning tool and tapping into the correlation of work and play. From scavenger hunts to Jeopardy and so much more, the Team Bonding of Activities, live, virtual, and hybrid, maximizes the impact of team building with an accent on fun. Visit teambonding.com to schedule your event now. Team bonding when you want seriously fun results. And speaking of fun, I'm back here still with Eva, Kanor, and Greg. Kanor, let me ask you, what actually takes somebody from improv and decides that I need to tell the corporate world of the benefits of this? (laughs) Yeah, it was actually more the corporate world telling me, uh, to be honest. So I um, was still at Deloitte, you know, a couple years after taking my first class. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, I was, so okay, I, I did not tell any of my friends that I was doing improv for a year and a half because I did not want them to come to my shows. I was so uh. terrified. Uh, I, was, I was always terrified of people, even though I grew up performing, I never loved people who knew me coming to see me pretend to not be me. You know? <laughs> it was always easier to do that in front of strangers, you know? Okay. And so like, even when I grew up singing and in plays and musicals, like, I never really wanted my parents to come, you know, cause it made me more nervous. <laughs> and so, so same thing with improv. I was just in the closet as an improviser for a year and a half from like my closest friends. <laughs> and so, but I was out of the closet at work because I was like, no one's going to, no one from work is going to come, come watch me, <laughs> you know? So it felt like a safe place to divulge my secret. Um, well, as it turns out, it was a really good place to to tell people because it was my colleagues at the consulting company who were like, hey, Knorr, we've been reading in Harvard Business Review and Fast Company and Forbes that improv is helpful for the business. Can you come do a workshop for my team or for my client? You know, and so I really just started doing it for my colleagues internally. And I was already interested in and becoming pretty expert in facilitation work and, you know, innovation as well. And mm. so... Uh, I just started doing it internally and really just at the request of my colleagues. And it was really they who showed me that like, oh yeah, this is applications to my day job that I, I maybe would have not discovered until much, much later had they not kind of brought it to my attention. So, so improv and diversity. I, I was watching snippets as I was getting ready for this of your, of your show, the, the white privilege, black power. And I got to say, first off, absolutely hysterical. And just the, the the methodology you guys go through to discuss things that people should be remarkably uncomfortable discussing or or have been before that. Actually, if you give me one brief second here, I want to play something that's one of my favorite bits for my audience. I'm, I'm here for the audition. Oh. <laughs> so before I start, I wanted to say that I grew up 
loving Bruce Lee movies. Okay. <laughs> The role of Bruce Lee in his, his biopic. Like, this is just a super exciting film. But I'm just really, I'm, I'm excited to be here. So I just want to say that, that I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. So that, of course, is you, Greg, discussing how, as part of a bit, you're ready to play Bruce Lee. That's right. Hilarious, <laughs> as you can tell from the audience's reaction. But what even brought this on? I mean, where, where did this germinate from? Not that particular sketch, just the idea of this is a way we can talk about diversity. Yeah, well, you know, I, I got my degree in government and politics. And so I thought at some point I might want to go become a politician. And then I realized I just liked performing. I didn't necessarily like <laughs> the job of a politician. And um, I You're think- like- Let's perform, hold the public service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I literally remember I was at it. I, uh, when I was in college, I was like the, the student liaison to the city council in College Park, Maryland. So I would like go to all the city council meetings and like be around all everything that was happening. And it was like a, at one point, a guy came up to me and he just started yelling at me like a guy I didn't even know. But like because I was like part of this body that he felt I, I was accountable to him. He just like, I'm going to unload on this dude. And I was like, oh, this job is not fun. Like, these people, <laughs> like, are, think that's entitled to, to do what it is. So I, I feel like, though, that, but in my soul, I always knew that, you know, I love being able to help and give back and, and make people's lives better. And so that was always kind of laying dormant. And then, you know, once the 2016 uh, election happened, I don't know if you remember after that, but, you know, we had the Women's March in D.C. Sure. And we had... Um, you know, all of a sudden people were uh, starting to decide to run for office in like small towns and all those types of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eve is part of a great organization that trains um, women to, to run for run for office. So it was one of those things where I was like, well, you know, I, I don't really want to become a politician. I don't really want to go in, and march in these marches because, you know, I was like, what do I have to give? And I was like, well, improv, like, you know, improv is a captive audience. They don't know, you know, kind of what what they're in for. So let's invite these people in and have this conversation uh, in, in front of them. And you know, one of the things I always always struck me is they, they did a study once of theater goers and they had all the theater goers that wear heart monitors. And when they were watching the show, their hearts all started beating in unison. Wow. Um, now you you can go online and find that that out and see if it's actually real or not, but that's something <laughs> that I read. And, and I, I, believe it, I believe it to be real because I've been in audiences before where you leave and it's just this amazing shared experience where you feel like you've had some level of oneness. Mm. And so I, that's what I really wanted to bring out was by having a conversation with Eva, who is someone who I know can like reach that level of openness and challenge me to reach that level of openness. It was like a great mutual relationship to be able to do that in front of people who, when they walk in and see both of us talking to each other, are going to have so much of their own stuff that they're bringing to the table and then have to just be open and watch people talk and have these people who you might not agree with make you laugh. Like that is a, is a huge gift to them to be able to see the world from a different standpoint. So that's really what I wanted to get out of the show. So Eva, first off, uh, would you like to give a shout out or the, at least the web address of the organization you're working for, for my listeners? Oh, sure. It's uh, Emerge Maryland. I, I was a 2015 uh, graduate. There's also Emerge America, which they're a national cha- uh, chapters all over the country but there's emerge maryland which i i went through and they do train democratic women to to run for office and have have had a lot of success yeah. um so definitely check them out if, if you're a woman who's democrat and in in a state check them out and see if they they have a program for you fantastic but for you eva personally i mean was it, greg brought this to you correct this idea yeah, yeah so so yeah so yeah greg brought it to me and i said oh that, that sounds cool like and it, it was different in some ways, because usually with imp- some improv, like you just get a word and you go for it. Sure. Some folks, you was, you'll have a storyteller. Someone will say a story and then you'll do it off of this. But yep. having us be the ones who are the storytellers or giving the, the material that we're coming from, that was different and that was intriguing to my, myself. And if I can just ask flat out, mm-hmm. Eva, what does diversity mean to you? Yeah, I think diversity to me is just like it's, it's being inclusive, right? Mm-hmm. And it's 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 getting representation from the whole spectrum of whatever that is. And it, and the thing is like there's diversity within Black folks, right? There's diversity within the AAPI community, you know, within the white community, um, within the Latino community, and all that. And I think it's the the diversity that you know that we're bringing. And I should say this too, like 
with um, our show, obviously the diversity I'm bringing is white. I'm black and I'm woman and Greg is is, is white and male. Mm. But there are some things that we don't have, right? Like we're both cisgender individuals, right? We're both heterosexuals. Mm. We both, we're, we're not AAPI. We're not Latino, right? And so there, we don't have a, a visible physical uh, disability when, you know, when we're talking to folks. So like, so like the, the thing is like, I know for me, that wasn't like top of mind. Like, I think it was like, it's always there. And then for us, it was more of like, here's the challenge of taking improv in a different direction while also giving an entertaining show as well. So let's talk about the show, White Privilege, Black Power. I mean, talk, tell us about that first performance. Was it something that, I mean, like you say, the audience does not know what they're getting into, but if you're bringing them into a show that is called White Privilege, Black Power, they got to have an idea of where you're going. Yeah, yeah, and and I'll I'll go first because I, I I had a question teed up ready for Greg. Uh, <laughs> go go go. Best, it's the best question that I I probably asked them. I you know, it was more it, the question was like Greg, do you ever like get when you wake up in the morning you just look in the mirror and you say thank God I'm a white man. Um, <laughs> and so uh, Greg Greg went on. I I he hammered it him him and hollered a little bit, uh, and I don't think he flat out said yes. But the undertone was like, yes. I, so. I think I, I said yes, but it was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> um. Actually, I think Greg looks in the mirror every morning and goes, look at my hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a full Greg body. Greg was like, if I say yes, is that technically white pride? Is it? Like, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lowercase W, lowercase P. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you guys feel, uh, well, first, can, can somebody actually explain to my audience what the show actually looks like? What is it you actually do? Sure. Well, what happens is uh, at the beginning of the show, I mean, it, it, it's usually just uh, Eva and I, if it's a live show, mm. um, where, where we just stand across from each other on a, a, in a, on a black box theater stage. Uh, and we each have questions for the other person that we haven't told them yet. So we're okay. surprising each other, but we have a mutual respect to not ask gotcha questions. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so we just start by asking each other questions and then being honest about the responses. And that might add lead to a little bit more back and forth. And then ultimately we jump into a scene, a comedy scene where we're able to highlight kind of the kernel of the idea that we found while we were talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Can you guys give me an example of one of your favorite interactions? One of the, the things I always think back to is when um, we were starting a show and, and you mentioned my hair in front of the audience, Eva said, I have a question for you. Can I touch your hair? <laughs> and then in, in front of the audience proceeded to run her hands through my hair. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think, I mean, this is how we're, you know, how can we be the most creative to get people thinking outside of the box for something that they might not know, or they maybe they ha think that they know. Mm. And of course, you know, the can I touch your hair thing is, is huge in the African-American community, particularly amongst women, where there's a lot of people who just don't know it's inappropriate to ask that question or to comment about that. And so for us to be able to explore that idea from the flip side mm. of now there's uh, a black woman wanting to touch a white man's hair and interested in his hair, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the assumptions that you had about like, what's right and wrong and acceptable, and unacceptable, you're being forced to rethink them. And mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of the benefit of, for the audience is, is to come at it from a different angle and think, oh, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. Eva, what about it, you? What's one of your favorite uh, interactions you had? Yeah. So one of our favorite, I, and I'm not sure how we, we got there, but this is one where we did have a guest. This is uh, Sabat, who's a, 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 mm -hmm. on the team with Kenora and I, and, and Greg knows her as well. And we were uh, playing a politician. And so the the way we were setting it up, it was like this politician who was like taking, you know, good looking, an incumbent and like, you know, gobs money, came, came for money, gobs money, you know, like silver spoon, every, everything, no obstacles <laughs> in life, really, right? Okay. Um, but they didn't want to be a politician. But here's the catch. The, what I, when I started out, I was, because uh, in my mind, I was like, I'm, I'm a white man. Like, I, I, I'm in my mind, I'm like, I'm playing a white man. Sure. But I was like, I need to make this clear to the audience. So I would say, I'm a white man. So, and then, so like, <laughs> man, and then it hit. And so like, I think, uh, particularly a hit for a lot of folks and enable it to dig down deeper in terms of what that looks like. And particularly like this, this man who is, a, is an elected official, has all his money, 
but wants to be, I think he wanted to be a hairdresser. I think that was really, and like his family didn't want him to do that. And so like, this was the pain that he was going through being forced into, you know, doing the glamorous life of a a politician. So that, that, that show definitely sticks out to me. So let me ask you guys, I mean, when you put on these performances, of course, the idea you want to be able to entertain people, you want them to laugh, you want them to come along in the journey with you. What do you hope for with this particular subject matter? What are you hoping to get at the end of the night? Well, I'll, I'll say selfishly, um, and it's really fun to look back at the videos and the history of all the shows we've done since 2017, because I can see myself growing as a person in this, uh, this work. And I, you know, I considered myself like a woke dude in 2016, <laughs> but there were a lot of questions and topics that I hadn't actually addressed or thought of. And so to go back and look at how I answered a question, one of the, the earlier, earliest questions Eve asked me was, do I think that black people can be racist? Mm-hmm. Mm. And at the time, my mindset was, oh, well, anyone can be racist because we all have uh, racial biases and we, we hear stories and things like that. But th- the idea of racism as a, a, a systematic oppression of different people and you have to have as a power structure, you have to have power to in order to enforce racism. Right. It's, it's like the difference between racism and racial bias. They're, they're not the same thing. And that was a, a thing I had not encountered before, but being asked it and having to answer incorrectly in front of an audience, yeah. then be told the correct answer and then do a comedy scene about how I didn't understand it. <laughs> like, like that, that was a, a growth point for me. Nice. And I think that, you know, I was able to take those lumps in front of the audience so that the people in the audience could, could go back into their own lives and say, oh, I had never thought about it this way, but they didn't have to be embarrassed in front of a, yeah. a crowd to do it. Very good. I want to add on to that in terms of like what what I hope and aim for like our, our corporate audiences mm-hmm. to get. Yeah. The piggyback on what, what Greg just said is like, you know, in comedy, we have this idea of like punching up or punching down, mm-hmm. right? Punching down is like, making fun of uh, or ridiculing those not in power, right? Right. Or those who are more vulnerable than you are. That's not funny ever, ever funny. (laughs) You know, the the scenes that Greg just described are examples of like punching up, right? Punching up at authority, up at people's in positions of power, of power. And that's where humor can really come from. And so I, my aim for um, our audiences in a corporate environment is yes, to laugh, of course, at that kind of the absurdity, you know, hopefully like Eva asking Greg, can she touch his hair, underlines the absurdity of anyone asking anyone to do that, mm-hmm. right? And so, but also like, who is the position of authority? Like who is who is worth being skewered, right? right. And, and why? Um, but also Greg and Eva, you know, take the pressure off the audience's shoulders because they are the ones who are using their skill to have through improv, these really difficult conversations, right? And so I think it provides an audience a lot of relief and it gives them kind of an entryway into having those conversations later on as well. Yep. And I would just say, it just also like adds a, a, I think for me, the show, like obviously it want to be entertaining, but like it just plants a seed, right? To like, it's just so one to, to think about it later on mm-hmm. in life. And then um, I'm also, I'm, I'm taking an acting class now and the, my instructor says this one line, uh, which is like, he's like, the, the goal of theater is uh, to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comforted. Nice. And so I think uh, that also in terms of like people being able to relate to this. So like black women see, you know, me asking this white man to run through his hair is an experience that they have gone through. I've gone through. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, is there. And then also those who may have been doing the, the touching or doing that, like being disturbed a bit and saying like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Right. Yeah. So I think that's just a, a nugget and it's a safe space uh, where we where, where we are in terms of doing it. I had, if I can share a story, I had a, a female friend of mine in high school who was just, she's a woman of color, one of my absolute best friends. And one day we're just walking to gym class. We had gym class at the same time. And she just grabbed my hand and started holding my hand all the way. And I'm you know, I'm an actor. I've always been an actor. I've always been a rather, that makes me a rather touchy-feely kind of person. So as I'm walking along, I'm just holding her hand too. And she turns as we're at the doors for her to go to the girls' locker room and me to go to the boys'. And she turns me, gives me a kiss and says, okay, bye, honey. I'll see you after. And I'm like, okay. And I go in. Afterwards, we get back together. And I'm like, can I ask what that was about? And she said, oh, yeah, there were like five black girls standing off to the side watching us as we were coming up holding hands. I was like, okay, but the kiss and the bye, honey. And she went, oh, 
we just got to shake them up sometimes. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but looking at a corporate level, Kanor, yeah. what are you hoping for the for your audience? What are you hoping for corporations to understand or to or to gather from all this? Yeah, you know, I think um, so. Everything I said earlier in terms of what I hope the audience kind of comes away with, but mm -hmm. I think in terms of like a corporate structure and culture, I, I hope that what um, what happens is that the fear is taken away from them. You know, like Eva and Greg have done what lots of people feel is the hardest part which is initiating and having these conversations. Like, sure. okay, now Greg and Eva have done that for you. And also by virtue of them doing it, you all have had a shared experience and you've laughed at the same things, right? There's a commonality there, right? And so I'm hoping that it is like this, this door opening to both, wow, not only was that not that hard, but also, wow, it was really enjoyable, right? So just mm -hmm. kind of doing a little bit of like, cognitive rewiring right to be like okay like we we can we can do this and and we should i mean not only that but we understand the value of it right but i think beyond that also you know what greg and eva do through like the performance part of improv is like they really dig deep and they're embodying people unlike themselves or they're embodying their experiences that are unlike the audience's experiences so i really hope it's also several steps in the direction of just like empathy right for mm. for different experiences as well yeah, I, w I was just going to say that I think that as we're doing these shows and we're doing them over, you know, Zoom and video chat now, and we're able to hear the questions that that they're asking, the employees are asking of us, but then also be able to see how they're talking in the chat feature to each other. Yeah. It really feels like this show has been a great pressure release valve for a lot mm -hmm. of folks to nice. be able to feel seen and to be able to, to get stuff out there in an environment that um, is supportive uh, instead of letting it fester and then, you know, having people, you know, do things that are not great. At one of the performances that we did, someone in the, one of the employees said, oh, I'm, I'm starting an anti-racism book club, but no people of color are joining the book club. And it was, this was a white person who, who was doing it. And then so even I had just had a discussion where we're talking about, hey, that's good. You know, as white people, you need to be able to do the work by yourself. And it's not the job of people of color to be able to, to teach you about that, which sure. is something that, you know, maybe people didn't know or didn't understand that that's not always appropriate to have someone at your job be the person you go to to, to talk about this stuff and learn from. And then we ended up doing a scene where I was starting a, a, a karate club at work. And Eva, going back to Bruce Lee, Eva's dad had studied under Bruce Lee, and I was trying to get her to uh, teach at my karate club in the office. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so it was like, so the, this idea of karate book club, I, f I feel like I walk away now when I think about <laughs> someone, someone trying to get an expert to teach them, and it's not the expert's job to teach yeah. them. I, yeah. think nice. I think karate book club. Yeah. And so <laughs> I, I awesome. hope that that audience walks away, and when they're, they're put into that position, they're like, Oh, karate book club. And like that can be like a, a lived yeah. in their bones experience of of knowing the the right thing to do in that situation. Mm -hmm. I was gonna ask, can you guys explain to my audience how the audience gets involved in this show? Because if anybody who's ever been to an improv show, it's you know, they're they're probably used to the I need uh, I need a, an area and I need a profession and I need, you know, a, an ed a relationship between two people. Um, what do you do what do you do to get the people involved in this? Yeah. Well, Greg, you want to talk about like the live show? Because hopefully soon we'll be able to do that again. But then I can talk a little bit about how I produce the the virtual show. Excellent. Yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. With the with the live show, I don't think we've ever done where we we've, we've gotten uh, questions from the audience. But you know, usually Greg and I will have a question like or, or two, one or two questions ready to go to ask each other uh, something. But then we will have a special guest, someone who's bringing a point of view that we don't don't have. And so like they'll have we'll have questions for that person and they may have questions for us and so like that, that in that respect it's 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 the performers doing it because we ask questions we get the response and then we do the scenes off of it and then when we feel like we've played it out we end it and then ask another question and, and go from from there okay yeah one of my favorite corporate gigs that we did is it was a meeting of group therapists who are all doing a conference together to learn about how they can use diversity, equity, and inclusion in their group therapy. That sounds like an improv sketch right there. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, and so what, what it was, there was, I think there was about 80 people in the audience yeah. and the, we were interviewing one of the women who was in the, the um, who was a group therapist. 
Mm. And what was really interesting, and she was essentially a colleague of all these people, but they didn't know her story. So we're interviewing her. She was um, a woman of color. She was a black woman. She was also blind and she had gone blind later in her life. Like, wow. And so we ended up having this long conversation with her talking about, you know, how she how she interacted with the world. And so everyone in that audience learned so much more about like this, the details of her really interesting life and how it's different, what she has to do that's different from them. And, you know, at every step of the way, we got to do little improv scenes and, and, and laugh about it and, you know, help people learn about it. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those experiences where we walked away and, you know, I, I think Eve and I are, are both really, really good at what we do. Sure. But after that, it felt like, oh, we really took these people to a different level. And it almost <laughs> felt like, like we had people coming up to us afterwards and like asking us questions. Like these are people, you know, therapists in their 50s and 60s who've been doing it for decades mm-hmm. saying like, okay, how can I incorporate this work into what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's like the, you know, the trickle down of you change one person and then they, you know, they have 50 clients and now they're interacting differently with those 50 people and then those 50 people. So it, it, that was really special for us to be able to, to be in that world. Yeah. Amazing. And, yeah. and then one thing I would add about that, that what that was special and it taught me something because there's there's one regret I have from that show is that the, the woman was blind. She was legal, legally blind. And I know as a performer, there was a part of me like, oh, I should my character should be blind. And I was like, no, then I don't want, you know, I don't want to make it seem like I'm making fun. But the thing is, like being blind is like being tall or being fat or being skinny. It's just it's just it is what it is. Right. Sure. Like. Greg being attractive. It is what it is, right? And so... Um, you haven't mentioned that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but really, like, what features, though? It's, it's, like a, it's the nose, Greg. It's, the nose. The hair? <laughs> it's that the nose, nose, man. Too. You got, okay. like, a sublime nose. <laughs> exactly. So I think for me, and the lesson with learn was, like, you can do just about anything if, if you're doing it in a way where you're not making fun. And it went, the, the thing is, like, I knew I wouldn't have done it where I'm making fun of being blind. Mm. But the thing is, there people who are blind in the world <laughs> so yeah. like it's a thing um and so um so i, I think that, was, that that's the one big takeaway i got uh from it. And in fact i even said that and the woman was like yeah you should have done it and i was like yeah but representation right it's like you know sometimes when you're an, or a baby improviser you're kind of cautioned against doing certain things and it's good because you're a baby improviser you don't have the skill to do it like wisely but like you know that there are all types of people, right? And if we're always only playing professional class people right. or educated people or white people or able-bodied people in scenes, you know, like that's not a true reflection of the world and probably even like our everyday experiences, you know? And so, yeah, yeah. So in the in the virtual setting, which we have like everyone have been, uh, been doing since mm-hmm. the pandemic began, I, I actually think one really big benefit of doing it virtually is that you can have more audience participation. So you can imagine in like, like a live show experience, it's, you might say, oh, hey, who in the audience wants to tell me like a story of when you were made to feel different? You know, like not everyone might feel confident enough to share that in like right. a crowd full of people and, right. and power to them, right? But what we can do in a virtual setting is we can send like a real simple two question survey, anonymous survey to the organization beforehand and collect these stories, you know? And, and me as a producer, um, I will uh, give them in the moment to Eva and Greg to improvise from. Mm. And so not only do we have that level of kind of like specific experience being drawn from that given audience, uh, which also actually turns into data for the company to kind right. of like use later on. Sure. Um, yeah. But also in the Zoom chat, people are always like giggling and laughing and ha ha ha, or they're like, oh, that reminds me of this other story. You know, people are I tend to be very like of their own volition, very active and communicative in the chat and kind of like commenting on what they're seeing in the scenes and, and relating to one another. So it's really, um, that was actually a surprise to me. I didn't, I wasn't expecting that to happen until we did our first uh, show last year and it, it's a very very cool natural thing that that happens so uh yeah so the virtual setting has of course its limitations but it's been a really a real good boon to kind of like involving the audience i think and and you know tapping into their experiences and using it for the shows let me ask you Kenor, what kind of feedback are you getting from corporations who have who have taken yeah. on? well gosh i think uh what well, when we did a couple couple shows ago greg the person at the end said, oh, wow, that was not only entertaining, but enlightening. I think that was the quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. Yeah, so the feedback has been really, really good. I think, yes, people have 
enjoyed it as a shared experience. They found it very compelling. And I think no matter what, every time people are, their fears are done away with. You know, they might have been apprehensive about like, how's this going to work? It's improv. We don't really yeah. know, you know, but I think once they've experienced like the deftness that Greg and Eva bring, they're like, oh, wow, that was really great. Yeah. And I understand a company who would be nervous because they don't sure. essentially know, they don't know who we are or like what we're going to unleash on their, right. their corporation. <laughs> but what I think is interesting about Eva and I as individuals compared to, you know, we both have day jobs where we like, like I'm negotiating millions of dollars of deals on a daily basis. Eva is like running outreach for, you know, getting people elected. Like we both have a lot of responsibility and are in constant communications on super high levels in our day lives. So we're, we're not going to go into some organization and then just, you know, make potty jokes or yeah. you know, do, do, do things that, that we wouldn't feel appropriate doing in our own businesses and, yeah. and you know, in our, in our own life. So I, th- I think that, you know, I, like if you hired a stand-up comedian to come in and do stand-up about DEI, yeah. I think you know that would be very yeah. scary. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for uh, for us to come in and do it, to me, it feels like we're just like an extension of being within our own corporations and businesses, and um, it feels like a very safe space for us. Nice. Yeah, what Greg brings up is a real, I wouldn't call it a rule, but it's something that I'm really passionate about in Mind Hatches organizational improv work is – you know, not to be like discriminatory, but just like, I want people like Greg and Eva who have kind of like workplace professional experience as well as improv experience. You know, like I I don't kind of have facilitators who are maybe just full-time improvisers or just full-time actors and actresses, you know? And so I, I really tried to send to organizations people who know how to relate, have worked in companies, have worked in organizations before and kind of can therefore deeply understand the experience as well as like the fears, right? And uh, that people have. So um, so that's definitely kind of strategic uh, on what Mindhatch does that I think is a little bit different than a lot of other um, other kind of applied improv and corporate improv places. Speaking of which, if I was a corporation that was looking to, after hearing all of this, to hire on white privilege, black power, Knorr, why don't you tell me where I can go? Oh, great. Well, you can go to the Mindhatch website. It's mindhatchllc.com. And you can go to our organizational improv page and you will find all you need there about white privilege, black power. Fantastic. Also on that page, I read a little something about a book called I Quit, The Life of Fermi <laughs> Joy of Giving Up. Really quick, can you just tell us a little bit about the book? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's actually more relevant than you think because the introduction to my book is very much the story I told about me being 19, a 19 year old perfectionist and quitting improv. That was an example of a bad quit, a not like the first <laughs> So the book, I Quit the Life Affirming Joy of Giving Up, is really, uh, it's a collection of stories um, of everyday real people that I interviewed about their quitting stories and how they summon the courage to really upend societal expectations, family expectations, cultural status quos, you know, to really kind of make the life they wanted and really, you know, unburden themselves of like the unfortunate stigma and shame that we give to quitting and to quitters. So yeah, my hope is that it will really inspire and motivate people to make big choices in their lives and to make sure that those choices are matching their values and to really start to like, you know, get rid of the shame and stigma that we attach to quitting. Excellent. Thank you. Can they, can they get the book from your website or do they need to go no, Amazon? They or? can pre-order it right now at iquitbook.com okay. and it will also be published in just three weeks. So the week of April 26th, it will be available on Amazon and in bookstores and in other places as well. I so. eagerly look forward to reading it. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Greg, what about you? Do you have a uh, website or anything that you want people to know they can reach out to you through? Yeah, well, um, as far as the White Privilege Black Power show, we do have a, an Instagram uh, account, which is just at White Privilege Black Power. So you can go check out some past clips there. My personal Instagram is um, at Greg Tyndale Comedy. Um, most of the stuff you'll see there is just video of me playing with my son's toys, uh, Star Wars, <laughs> my Marvel toys, Jurassic Park. We're real big into Jurassic Park dinosaurs right now. It's, awesome. it's a pretty big, pretty, pretty cool gig. Um, <laughs> and then I've got videos just of my comedy stuff on my YouTube page, which you can find at gregtindale.com. Excellent. Eva, go. Yeah, same for me. I get an IG, uh, just uh, at Eva R. Lewis. Uh, so check it out there. Um, and then my day job is I'm the executive director for the Maryland Democratic Party. So if you're in Maryland, go check out our website, mddems.org, if you'd like to find out more. Fantastic. Guys, I, I don't know what to say. My producer, Melissa, has been yelling in my ear as the time has been going by. 
<laughs> because I was enjoying this so much. And, and I personally, I think it's a remarkably important conversation that not enough people are having. So I want to thank each and every one of you for coming on board and for being on the podcast. It means the absolute world to me, someone you've never met. So <laughs> I, I, I cannot thank you enough because quite honestly, I have been doing this. We had a first season team building around the world. And I was telling my, I was telling my producer at the end of it, I went, wow, did you notice how about 80% of the people I interviewed look just like me? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we heard yeah, that there's a whole other side? Handsome. Yeah. Handsome. I yeah. meant like white haired. But yes, <laughs> that's exactly it's your what birthday. I said. Take the compliment. It's Thank you. Thank you, Kenor. Yes, I will. Thank you. I will take that compliment. But unfortunately, I'm going to take that compliment and I'm going to throw it back in your face because it's time for my speed round. Corny radio show sound effects done. Okay, the way this is going to work, you guys, I am going to start a, a stream of music that's going to last for 60 seconds. At that time, I will either ask you specifically a question, like if I say Eva, Greg, or Kenor, you answer that question. If I don't say anyone specifically, it's the first person to shout out an answer. You guys are working together as a team. The number to beat, because you want to see how many questions you can actually get through answering them. The number to beat is 13. So good luck to all of you. Let me make sure I have the actual right 13 button. 13 in how many seconds? In 60, 60 seconds? 60 oh, seconds. Right. 13 questions. 60 yeah. seconds. It sounds easy. Let's see how well you do. I know. <laughs> As soon as the music begins, I'll start asking the first question. Here we go. Greg, how old is your child? Seven and, and three. Eva, how long have you been in politics? Uh, 11 years. Kenor, who's your favorite historical figure? Oh, God. Uh, Abraham Lincoln. If you could live in any TV home, which would it be? Simpsons. First answer. Uh, Ava, if you could time travel, where would you like to go? Past or present or future? Uh, future. Kenor, uh, tell me one thing you learned in kindergarten. Uh, how to eat Play-Doh. <laughs> Favorite ice cream flavors? Chocolate, anything chocolate with stuff inside. Best childhood memory? Uh, sledding down the hill in my neighbor's, uh, my best friend's uh, yard. If you could eat any food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Chocolate. What celebrity do you think is lame? <laughs> okay, I I know I was holding you all up because the people who live out west were going. We can't answer this. They live here, <laughs> guys. That was fantastic. You got ten. Oh, Nine total. I mean ten. It's harder when it's all of you working together because you're trying uh, to be yeah. polite. And I get it. It's okay. I totally that ten thousand dollars is gonna make up for it. Yes. Yes. Your coupons <laughs> are in the mail. Coupons. Oh, my friends, that's it. That's another episode of Team Building Saves the World. And I feel like we actually did a little saving of it today, if I'm perfectly honest. Let's all give a big round of applause to my guests, Eva Lewis, Greg Tyndale, and Kenor Bahal. <laughs> Guys, again, thank you so much. I can't tell you how much this meant to me. And thank you to all of my team out there. Please always remember, uh, if you have been a fan of this podcast or you're just getting on it, but you even liked what you heard today, tell all your colleagues, tell your friends, and we would love if you could subscribe to us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. We're still even on Spotify. Plus, you can leave us a comment on all of our social media, Team Bond Podcast. And we hope that you come back here again. Never forget, my friends, from me to all of you. If you are within the sound of my voice, you are now on my team, and I am always on yours. Thanks again from Team Building Saves the World. This has been Rich Brennan's Land. You guys have a good day. I'll see you next time. I love that.
been said that you learn more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. So why not put your coworkers to play with the help of the team at Team Bonding? Team Bonding was founded over 20 years ago with one simple question. How can employees have a great time while fostering strong, authentic bonds between people who work together? Their catalog of innovative events includes scavenger hunts, Jeopardy, and much more. Each activity, whether live, virtual, or hybrid, maximizes the impact of team building with an accent on fun. Visit teambonding.com to schedule your event now. Team Bonding, when you want seriously fun results. 